We're in this series called Intentional Living because we recognize that choices have a huge impact on who we are and who we're going to become. Some people even go so far as to say that we are the sum total of all the choices we have made. Perhaps you've heard that. They say that when you add up all the choices you've made in the past, you get to who you are today. I actually think that's utter nonsense, to be honest. It's overly simplistic and fails to take into account all the factors and influences of our lives, over which we have no control whatsoever. But nevertheless, you get the idea. Since we have no control over many of the things that have happened in our lives, and we have no control over many of the things that are going to happen in our lives, it is vitally important that we make the best decisions possible, the most effective choices whenever we can. Last week, Rebecca talked about choosing purpose over popularity, and next week, Rebecca is going to talk about choosing discipline over regret. But this week, I'm focused on choosing surrender over control. When Rebecca was introducing this series last week, she confessed that she is a bit of a control freak, and she implied that because she had struggled with being a control freak, that it was better for me to preach this message. And I really wanted to start this message with some examples of her control freakishness, but I just couldn't think of any. And the truth is, I don't really think she's a control freak, at least not anymore. Instead, she's just freakishly good at being organized, and when confronted with that level of organization, it is just wise to go along with it and see where it takes you. And that's, the, look, that's not to say that she wasn't a control freak. She really was. Last Sunday, we celebrated our 23rd wedding anniversary. So I spent a lot of time last week in this, reflecting on our life together at the same time, thinking about this sermon. And one of the things I really have appreciated and valued in the last few years is the way in which Rebecca has grown and changed with God's help. She really is inspirational to me in this. And I have to say, I want some of her spirituality to rub off on me because the reality is, in many ways, I'm much more of a control freak. For instance, there is a right way to stack the dishwasher and it drives me bonkers when people stick plates and stuff in there all willy-nilly. Do you know what I'm saying? It's frustrating and I want to kick everyone out of the kitchen and do it myself or even better, slap anyone who does it wrong until they do it right. You, I know there are people out there who agree with me and know exactly what I'm talking about. Also, anyone who's worked with us will know that I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to graphic design and, and stuff like that. And if you come to work here in the office with us uh, and you volunteer to make a flyer or a poster, I will probably politely decline your offer of assistance. But if by some miracle I accept your offer, I will also make a time to sit down with you and help you fix it because I'm a control freak when it comes to that sort of stuff. I admit it. All right, well... the. <laughs> So that might be a little bit trivial. Fair enough. All right. But what about some of the more serious and consequential parts of our lives? There are so many parts of our lives that we don't control. Circumstances we can't manipulate, but we desperately want to. Not only can we be frustrated when we know something needs to be done right, but we can be afraid of what will happen if something doesn't happen or if someone doesn't act the way they should. Fear of that Poor consequences can drive some pretty destructive behaviors. Stuff that can ruin relationships, cause conflict and fire up resentment for years. Of course, the best examples of bad behavior can usually be found in the Bible. Genesis chapter 16 tells a particularly bad story about Sarah, a control freak whose life wasn't turning out the way she hoped and God had promised her, at least not according to her timing. And we pick up the story from the scriptures in verse 1 of chapter 16 of Genesis. Sarai, Abram's wife, hadn't yet produced a child. See, God had promised her to be the, the mother, or promised Abram to be the father of many nations. But she hadn't yet produced a child. But she had an Egyptian maid named Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, God has not seen fit to give me a child. Sleep with my maid. Maybe I can get a family from her. Abram agreed to do what Sarai said. And so Sarai, Abram's wife, took her Egyptian maid Hagar and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. Abram had been living 10 years in Canaan when this took place. He slept with Hagar and she got pregnant. And when Hagar learned that she was pregnant, she began to look down on her mistress. And Sarai, pretty unsurprisingly, told Abram, It's all your fault. I'm suffering this abuse. I put my maid in bed with you, and the minute she knows she's pregnant, she treats me like I'm nothing. May God decide which of us is right. Abram says, you decide. Your maid is your business. So Sarah begins to be abusive to Hagar until the point where Hagar runs away. 
Sarah did what a lot of us do sometimes. When, when God's timing wasn't her own, she decided to take control and try to bring about a desired outcome in her own way. It's a perfect example of control gone bad. That's one, this one controlling situation didn't just result in a breakdown in relationship between Sarah, Hagar and Abraham. It ended up impacting people for centuries to come. Hagar eventually gave birth to a son named Ishmael. Later, in God's timing, Sarah conceives and gives birth to Isaac. Tradition tells us that the descendants of Isaac are the Israelites, Moses and the Jews. Tradition also tells us that the descendants of Ishmael are the Palestinians, Muhammad and the Muslims. History shows us how Sarah's control freak moment has led to generations of war and conflict. So today's first lesson is don't sleep with someone named Hagar. Okay, fairly simple, right? Well, chances are you'll never be tempted with that option, but you will be tempted with something. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you're going to be tempted with, but there is someone here who's going to be tempted to take control when something doesn't go your way. Right now, wherever you are, I want you to think about it and write it down. You know, some, some part of your life that you're trying to control. Maybe it's a person, a thing, a circumstance. What I want you to do is think about it for a moment. Think about it and give it a name. Take out your phone, open the notes app and write it down. What are you trying to control? Are you trying to control your parents? Are you trying to control your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse? Are you trying to control your kids? Are you trying to control your grown kids? Are you trying to control your grown kids' kids because they're not raising your grandkids right? Are you trying to control your finances, your job future, your image? What is it you're trying to control? Well, our guiding piece of wisdom in this comes from Proverbs that Rebecca read uh, a little bit earlier for us. A pretty famous text, and I'm sure some of you at least know and resonate with some of the words. The words say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. Now, look down at your notes app or go back to your notes app if you looked up the Bible in your phone. Look at what you wrote. Think about that thing you are trying to control. And in the light of what Proverbs Proverbs says, ask yourself the question, is this something mind to control or is this something that I'm going to have to trust the Lord with all my heart and lead not on my own understanding and acknowledge him and trust that he will make my path straight today along those lines I'm going to ask three questions that I want you to consider when it comes to choosing surrender over control and the first question to ask ourselves when looking at this this thing that we're trying to control the first question is this is it worth my concern In a relationship, you can have control or you can have intimacy, but you can't have both. You you can have control but you can have an an intimacy, but you can't have them both at the same time. Sometimes we get really frustrated by the things that really aren't that big of a deal and we hurt our relationships because it's not that big of a deal and we think it is. You have to ask yourself, is this really my concern? Is it really that much of a deal? Is it worth damaging my relationship with my wife and kids by going off at them about how they stack the dishwasher? No, it's not. Is it really worth damaging your relationship with your kids or spouse because they don't put the toilet roll on the holder the right way with the paper hanging out? Is it worth damaging your relationship with your parents or grandparents by going off at them when they post something awkward, annoying or racist or whatever to Facebook? One day, you know, my kids are going to be gone. They're going to have grown up and left home and I'm really going to miss them. I, I'm going to miss the dishes not being put in the right way and I'm going to miss the toilet rolls not being put on the right way. I'm going to miss the shoes and stuff lying around the house. Is it really worth my concern? The first question is, is it really worth it? And the second question is this, is it mine to control? Is it something that I should do something about? Because honestly, sometimes the answer is yes, right? There, there is a big difference between surrendering control to God and relinquishing responsibility. You see, when God made Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden to tend it. They had responsibility just like we do. For example, if you're messed up financially, you're stuck in debt and whatever else, you can't just sit around saying, oh, okay, God's going to come through for me. I must surrender it to God and God's going to solve all my problems. Well, God's going to go, no, I gave you two hands, two feet. You go, go to work. Don't spend so much. Spend less than you're making. Get a second job. Do something about it. You know, there, there's a responsible element in this as well, in that. What about if your marriage is in trouble? What can you do? Can you, uh, you, you, can you, you can adjust your heart. You can examine yourself. You can suggest, 
maybe we should try counseling. Maybe we should get into a life group with, and, and get some spiritual connection to other couples. What about if your child is making bad decisions? Well, you can be available to your child. You can build the bridge as far as it be with you. You can make sure the lines of communication are open and available. You can do what it takes in those situations. So ask yourself quite honestly, whatever it is that you've written down, is it mine to control? Is there some part of this that I can participate in a solution for? If it is, then do something. So the questions are, is it worth my concern? And is it mine to control? And thirdly, is it for God alone? See, if this is one of those areas that you're trying desperately to control, and it's definitely worth your concern, but it's not yours to control and you don't know what to do, then it's something we can do nothing about, so we need to surrender it to God alone. The Apostle Paul in the first century is under house arrest, chained to a guard, and he writes these words to a church in, in Philippi. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, no matter what you're going through, no matter what she said, no matter what he said, no matter what you can't change, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We can pray. We must pray. We, we can pray boldly go before the throne of grace. We've been given unprecedented access to God. I mean, that word gets used a lot at the moment, doesn't it? Unprecedented. But I tell you what, access to God is unprecedented. He hears our prayers. He works for us in everything for those who love him. If you're married and your spouse is making bad decisions, you ask yourself, can I change my spouse? Some of you might think you can. Let me tell you, you can't. You can make your spouse miserable. You can make them crazy. You can drive them away. You can force him to conform for a little while, but he'll resent you and kick back. You can't change your spouse. God can. God's the only one who can. All you can do is pray. Can you physically heal your body or the body of someone you love? My mate has cancer. Can I wave a wand and cure him of cancer? No, I can't. I, mean, I, I can help him get treatment. He can get doctors. He can get eat right. He can do exercise and all that. But can I heal him? No. All I can do is lift him to God in prayer and ask God to heal him. Can you control your kid's future? No. You can do everything right, but there's still a possibility that they'll find themselves on a path that worries you. You can threaten them. You can get angry at them. You can, you can be all passive aggressive. You can try and manipulate them, but it doesn't matter what you do, you can't control their future. Can God be actively involved in their future, leading, him in the right, leading them in the right and wise ways? Yes, of course he can. So what do you do? You do what you can do. You invest in your children and ultimately you pray. So turn back to your notes app. Look at what you wrote down. Look at the name, look at the situation, look at the thing and then whatever. And then think through these questions. Is it worth your concern? Is it yours to control or is it for God alone? One of my favorite prayers comes from Reinhold Niebuhr. Lots of you know it. I wonder if you might like to think of what it is that you are trying to control and pray this prayer with me. The serenity prayer. God, give me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen.